Yes. So Dr. Kim, thank you so much for allowing me to pick your brain today. So my audience really doesn't know you. So tell us a little bit about your background, what you do, and why it's so important for every single person listening to this episode. Well, of course, because of my namesake, it's the best name in the world. So <laughs> always when um, the ex dietitian extraordinaire Kim asks me to do something, I do it because my name's Kim. Um, so um, my name is Kim Johnson Hatchett. I am a board certified neurologist um, and I live in the Midwest um, with a uh, husband and two kids. Um, I uh, did my residency in neurology, my um, fellowship in neurophysiology. Um, I also have written a book um, called Retrospective Calling um, about mm -hmm. my journey to becoming a physician later on in life. Um, and I um, really enjoy and am passionate about educating um, not only uh, women, but just people in general, and especially people of color, about their health um, and how um, neurology, the brain, because mm -hmm. it controls everything, um, mm -hmm. is so important. Your brain health is so important. So I um, also like to motivate people um, because I feel like, you know, our mental health really uh, pours into our physical health right. and understanding where we are mentally can really ground us um, going forward in our lives and help help us figure out what our, our, our true calling is. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm active on the gram. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm <laughs> one of those people. Um, but other than that, that's that's pretty much about me. I do some administrative work at my hospital, but I really enjoy taking care of patients. And I absolutely love that. Um, I'm active on the gram too, and that is how we met. Uh, you are definitely one to um, get inspiration from and also like just a plethora of knowledge because, you know, I always believe people perish for a lack of knowledge. Yes. So, you know, especially when speaking about the brain, when speaking about neurology, like, like let's talk about that. Cause as you stated, it's an organ that controls everything in our bodies. And I feel we don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. So let's start with just simple human anatomy and physiology. Like what is the function of the brain, the lobes and what does it do for us? Wow. So the brain um, is a control center for everything. Your brain never sleeps. Mm. Um, it uh, even when you're asleep, the brain's mm. not asleep. Um, so your brain is, uh, and your other organs actually do slow down. Your gut slows down, but it's mm. because your brain sends a signal and saying, "Hey, I'm gonna release these hormones," right. and you go to sleep. Everybody, slow down. I got you. And right. now I'm going to reach out and start redoing DNA. So like you're in the middle of the night is when the most um, important functions of the brain actually happen. It's so fascinating. Um, but in, in general, so the brain, it is the control center for everything. Um, from the brain, you have all of these things called neurons um, mm -hmm. that are nerves. They're the, they're, the, they're the cells of brain that make a brain tissue. And they um, uh, have their nucleus or their center part in, the, in your lobes of your brain and they send signals or nerves down to everything else in your body. So mm -hmm. your skin has nerves, your um, heart has nerves, your throat has nerves, your intestines, your feet, your muscles, right. all of the body, organs in your body, even your blood vessels have nerves connecting to them. And so your brain is constantly sending signals back and forth to all of these things to make everything work you know, perfectly in conjunction. And there's parts of your body that I know that, that we know we can control our breathing right. function, our talking function, our um, walking, but there are parts of our body that we don't control that our brain controls for us. Mm -hmm. So like, if we're afraid, our brain says, "Uh Oh, they might need to run. I'm right. going to stop their gut from doing anything and push blood to their legs and make them fight or blood to their arms to fight or flight or run. Right. So your brain has basically stopped shunted blood from your, from your gut to everything else. But when you're relaxed, your brain says, there's no need to run. Hmm. They're over here eating. Let me <laughs> shunt some blood to their gut so they can rest and digest. So it's like your brain is literally controlling everything that's happening within your body, even when you don't have conscious uh, thought about it. Right. So does that make sense? Right. Of course, of course it does. I mean, you know, just think about it. 
it's an organ that does not rest. You know, you mentioned that earlier and seeing that it, it basically is the powerhouse or like, you know, we learn about in school, the mitochondria of every single thing or right. every other organ that's going on in the body. It's amazing. So I know, you know, recently in the news, allegedly, supposedly, there was an actor that mm. may have had um, a brain related issue, such as a stroke. Right. Um, allegedly, supposedly, we don't know yet. The family didn't release any information. But according to the CDC, um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a stroke and every yes. three and a half minutes, someone dies from it. So, you know, I wanted to talk about that just a little bit. So what is a stroke and are there different types of strokes? Okay. So, yes. So what is a stroke? A stroke is when there is a blockage of blood flow to a certain part of the brain and those brain cells in that part of the brain start to die. Hmm. That's what a stroke is. Um, and so for every second that that blood flow is stopped, 32,000 nerves, neurons are dying. Wow. 32,000. That's how many, that's think that, that means we have billions of ner neurons in our brain, mm -hmm. billions of them. And contrary to popular belief, we use damn near most of them. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, oh, you mm -hmm. only use this portion of your brain. You use your brain. You use your whole brain. You just mm -hmm. use it. Um, and so there's two different types of strokes. Um, two big, you pick up, look at the big category of strokes. There's two different types. There's ischemic strokes, meaning mm -hmm. that you have a clot. So like from cholesterol or from a blood clot um, that travels from the big arteries to the smaller arteries up into your brain and lodges into an artery. So that's an ischemic stroke. And so that means it's it's lodged there and it's those tissue around that are dying. Mm -hmm. Or you can have a hemorrhagic stroke, mm -hmm. which is what allegedly that person might have had. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where a blood vessel in your brain burst mm -hmm. and there's blood there. But that blood flow that's supposed to be flowing to that tissue is not getting blood flow and that tissue dies. So gotcha. in, in, in essence, a stroke is where tissue dies. It's kind of like how a heart attack is because right. there's a blockage in that portion of the heart and that heart tissue dies. Right. That's what a stroke is. Um, Interesting. So it's, and it's, it's fascinating because you say so many people die, but I, I tell my patients, there's a fate worse than death to me. And that's mm. having a devastating stroke and being left alive. Mm. Um, so, I mean, you can imagine people become, that's one of, it's one of the most, um, the, one of the highest uh, uh, causes of preventable, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Preventable um, disability. Yes. That's the word I'm looking for. Disability, preventable disability in this country because patients become disabled. And I mean, I say disabled, some people are left not able to talk. They're not able to swallow. They're not able to move one side of their body. God forbid they have a basal or artery stroke and they can't move any parts of their body. I mm -hmm. mean, there's a, there's some devastating strokes that leave you alive um, right. where you will wish you were dead. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because, you know, I'm just thinking about my own personal family. I have two aunts and they were both on birth control for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And both of them ended up having strokes. One of them is completely aphasic. She mm -hmm. has to write everything down. And then my other aunt is paralyzed on her right side. So, you know, just seeing how, you know, the manifestation of how strokes impact different parts of the brain and how yes. it leaves you um, paralyzed in two different manners is so interesting to me. And, you know, just speaking with both of my aunts, you know, them sharing their experiences with me, the one that is unable to verbalize states, you know, she's writing down, she's highly frustrated that, you know, people yes. can't understand her. And then my other aunt, the one that is paralyzed on the right hand side, she states that, you know, she's dominant on the right hand and she's so frustrated that she can't be able to do the things that she wants to do. So you mentioned that it is preventable. So let's talk about that a little bit about the, the prevention, because I always believe an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, you know, the, all those old sayings. So right. talk, talk to us a little bit about things that we can do to prevent it or signs that we could look for in our friends, our family and our neighbors and how we can act quickly from that. Okay. So the signs and the prevention. So the prevention side of things, 
um, are the, basically the same things that you do to prevent a heart attack. So mm -hmm. you want to monitor your blood pressure. You want your blood pressure to be 120 over 80 or lower. Like you right. just want to have good blood pressure. And if you can't get it from diet and exercise, then bite the bullet and get on the medication. Um, right. I recently had to be put on blood pressure medicine. I exercise, I eat right, but I have a family history of high blood pressure and I had to face that fact. Um, right. So it's okay. But you, yeah. you want your blood pressure to be well controlled. I went to the doctor, 112 over 70. I was like, there you go. That's what you want. <laughs> you want your cholesterol to be low. So you want your bad cholesterol, excuse me, to be low. You want your good cholesterol, your HDL to be high. Mm -hmm. And if you have to get put on medication, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. You might have to. Right. But diet, exercise, eating really good fruits and vegetables, like things that you you definitely give people things to do and, and really step-by-step -step things to do because not only is cholesterol a big thing, but diabetes is a mm. huge reason why people have strokes. Right. Um, and it's one of those things that because what diabetes does to arteries, it hardens arteries. It really hardens mm -hmm. them and builds up plaque. And if you have that along with high cholesterol, you're just ripe for a stroke. Mm -hmm. And certain types of strokes happen with diabetics or higher risk for diabetics. Mm -hmm. um, that are even less treatable than the ones that happen to people with high cholesterol. Interesting. Um, and then um, you will exercise, obesity increases your risk of stroke. Sleep mm -hmm. apnea increases your risk of stroke. So untreated sleep apnea. So if your loved one's snoring like a whale, really? then you need to probably, yes, that's a, oh. it's a big, and it's a, it's a higher risk of wake up strokes um, with sleep apnea. Wake up um, strokes. What What is that? Wake up strokes. Uh, strokes where you you wake up from sleep and you've had a stroke in the middle of the night. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And those wow. are harder to treat because you don't know the time of onset. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna get back to time of onset and time what time has to do with stroke, you know, prevention and stroke treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so you have sleep apnea, you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, smoking mm -hmm. also hardens those arteries and increases your risk of stroke. Um, smoking in general, just smoking right. in general, whatever you smoke, because it's right. all, you can smoke anything nowadays. <laughs> so whatever you smoke, um, those that can really increase your risk of uh, of stroke and of course heart attack. Um, Would you add so va I, vaping to that list? Because I know some people say I don't smoke, I vape, and they think it's like two completely separate things. So the the here's the thing with vaping: like most of my pulmonary doctors say, I'd rather you smoke than vape because I don't know what's in that stuff you don't know what's wow. in there um, at least I know the poison that's in a cigarette they've been right. made to tell us what's in that so I know what I'm fighting there I don't know what I'm fighting with vaping so I don't know it's the the date there's not enough data for me to say that vaping increases your risk of stroke but I just I don't know what you're inhaling into your body so from a lung issue I, I just wouldn't recommend it at all exactly so Wow. But that's back to uh, treatment and the mm -hmm. signs. So the big sign is sudden, sudden changes. So mm -hmm. with strokes, they normally is a sudden deficit of some type of function in your body. Mm -hmm. um, so you suddenly like you think about the acronym fast. Right. Um, you can have facial weakness. You can have arm or leg weakness. You can have facial numbness, face, arm and leg numbness. Um, you can have a change in your speech. Like you mentioned, your aunt is aphasic. Aphasia is a form of speech deficit where you can comprehend sometimes what someone's saying to you, but you can't get the words out. So mm -hmm. it, it, and it is usually extremely frustrating because they cannot talk, mm -hmm. but they understand and know what they want to say, but they cannot get the words out. Their brain, that, that signal has been cut off, which is mm -hmm. so, so sad. So and it's usually that part of the brain is usually in the left side, no matter whether you're left or right-handed, that's the mm -hmm. left side of your brain that has that function. Um, and then time. So mm -hmm. again, sudden change, sudden loss, sudden onset of dizziness, sudden curtain go down vision in one eye loss, um, certain, mm -hmm. in, you know, sudden imbalance. All of those things can happen suddenly with a stroke. And as soon as you, as something like that happens, it's time to call 911. It's not time to take an aspirin and lay down, mm. which happens so so often um, because strokes don't necessarily hurt. Certain right. strokes, like hemorrhagic strokes hurt because that uh -huh. brain 
is being bathed with blood and it's like, oh my God, what is this? And it's an irritant. And so it's very painful. But those only are about mm, maybe 15 to 20% of strokes. The rest of them are ischemic strokes and those don't hurt. So wow. you're not feeling any pain. You're just noticing a loss of function. Unlike heart attacks that hurt horribly. So you're like, mm -hmm. oh, hell, I got to call 911. <laughs> right. I, I can't be in this kind of pain. But if, if strokes hurt that way, we would get a lot more treatments um, because people would feel the pain and go for it. But unfortunately, strokes don't hurt. So people don't call 911 like they should. Because right. we can, if you get there, get to the hospital in a, in a normal, in a good amount of time, like if with six hours or less from the onset of symptoms, we can do something about it normally. Normally we can do something about it. We can give wow. you a clot busting drug or we can go in and pull the clot out. We can do a lot of things to help treat strokes. We just have to, you have to definitely get there in time because if you get there too late, me pulling that clot out can cause more damage than, than you really don't want to deal with. Oh man, oh my, you know, all these things that, you know, we never considered before. Cause you know, you know, you brought up a very good point, you know, knowing what your labs are, knowing your blood pressure, knowing your cholesterol, taking your meds as prescribed, definitely yes. dwelling on that. Because, you know, I realize a lot of people, they come to me in my practice and they say, Kim, you know, the doctor put me on this medication and I'm like, you know, I'm a dietitian. I'm not a pharmacist. I'm not a doctor, you know? And I say, always say to them, there's a reason for that. Like, just mm -hmm. don't take yourself off of these medications. If you have questions, go back to your doctor. Medications help the body. I, yes. I know a lot of people think it's there to, to poison their system and it's going to cause all these side effects, but I'm very happy that you stated Sometimes our body does need a little help. It's okay to take the blood pressure medication. It's okay to take the cholesterol medication. I have known individuals that have come off of their blood pressure medication and they've gotten a stroke and they thought that XYZ herb could help them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm just, it's, it's just, I mean, I'm very glad that you said that because it is quite amazing. Another thing that you mentioned, which I just wanted to reiterate for those listening is the signs the facial drooping, the slurred speech, the um, you know lack of coordination, things of that nature. Like now is the time to call nine one one. Just don't like take an aspirin and lay down. So I definitely think that that's important as well. So with these signs and symptoms, you know, I started wondering to myself, and I can't remember if I saw this on the American Heart Association website, just speaking about gender and how strokes impact men versus women differently. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, I think unlike heart attacks, because we know that heart attacks will, uh, will come on to women differently than men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, strokes in women. And, and I have to preface this. I work at a, in a, in a hospital that mainly treats men. I work at a veterans hospital. Um, mm -hmm. and so my, the women that I've taken care of have been, um, a lower number, but, um, women tend to have, um, strokes that present later. Um, mm -hmm. and the reason why I think is because of who we are as women, we think, oh, I can push through this. Oh, this isn't, and they're, or they've had, off and on like stuttering TIAs or transient ischemic attacks and they've ignored those symptoms. Wow. So I think that that's one of the things that I've, uh, I've, they have done studies on is that women tend to, to present either they, after they've had the stroke, they say, well, you know what, this has been happening and I just ignored it. Um, women tend to push off the symptoms a little bit further and they present a little bit later than men do just because of the nature of what women, a lot of women do, unfortunately. Right. Um, and so ignoring those symptoms is probably one of the worst things that you could do. Um, and you have to take it seriously. You know, you don't have to get Johnny to the bath and you don't have to cook dinner today. If you're having these symptoms, say something, it's not just right. nothing and push mm -hmm. it off, get it treated. Right. I think sometimes, you know, we're so concerned about taking care of others right? that we don't take care of ourselves. And I'm very happy that you said that, like, you know, not pushing off or like, you know, working through the pain, um, but just realizing that, you know, your health comes first. Because if, you know, push comes to shove, a stroke does happen and you are rendered incapable of going like your day-to-day -day life, then that does bring a burden on your family as well. So, yeah. wow. I, I do, I do like the fact that you said that, you know, pushing it off, 
you know, just to really encourage women, encourage our gender to take control and pay attention to our health. So let's talk a little bit about the complications related to a stroke. I know that you alluded to that earlier, you know, mm -hmm. when speaking about my aunt with the aphasia and then the other one that is paralyzed on the right-hand side, what are other complications that you've seen in your career? Um, depression. Um, mm. And in and, and depression, that is um, not necessarily the depression that people have um, prior to a stroke. So, so depression that is brought on by a chemical imbalance, but the depression that people have from being left devastated. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of like the depression that you have after a death um, mm. in your family, because it's sort of a death of a part of your body. You know, right. you're, you, you might be able to get some of that function back. Um, and the younger you are, when you've had the stroke, the, the higher the chance and the, and the, the sooner you get physical therapy or speech therapy, the more likelihood you're going to be able to get some of those things back because those nerves are really trying to grow back. They're trying, right. but nerves don't grow back well. So this is what I tell my patients when a stroke happens or when you have um, a nerve severed, um, you have that signal is not there anymore, right? That signal mm -hmm. that's going to those muscles or to your speech or to your eye is not there anymore. And it's a really slow process of, uh, of rebuilding. So you're, you're down on the coast and there's like this highway that is out on the water that, that what's that highway that's out on the water that goes someplace. In is, it, Florida. is it a 95, 75? Sure. You can tell me anything. 95. 95. We'll, we'll say Highway 95. 95. I just know I've seen pictures of this highway that's over water. So imagine if that highway like collapsed mm. and you needed to rebuild it. But the people that are rebuilding it are blind and you're not going to help them. And you're giving them one brick at a time. That's how slow it is for nerves to regrow. And it's wow. not going to be good because you're not helping them, right? They're blind and you're not helping them. And so the way that they grow back is not great. Can they grow back? Yes, but it takes time. Um, so that's the way that, that's how slow nerve regrowth is. That's how slow and imperfect nerve regrowth is. Um, so you have to really work hard. That's why you have to work hard in physical therapy and speech therapy to get it to come back. Um, so it, and you can help it by, you know, food, nutrition, all those, you know, exercise, all of those things will help generate things faster will give the 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 builders more you know oomph to do their thing might mm -hmm. give them a little bit of vision to say oh there's a direction of where we need to go let's rebuild but it's still going to be slow wow. so depression and then of course disability so mm -hmm. not being able to move once out of your body um and you know most of us are left brain dominant um mm -hmm. so even if you're someone like me who's left-handed most of us are left brain dominant and there are certain areas in your, on the left side of your brain that, that house speech. So mm. not only the um, way that you talk and can, you know, actually speak words, but your comprehension of speech. So mm. there are certain types of strokes that will hit globally and globally have global aphasia um, mm -hmm. and global aphasia is where you can't understand what someone's saying to you and whatever you're saying back to them doesn't make any sense either. So right. you have no way to communicate with anyone and you have no way to say your needs. If you're in pain, if you're, I mean, it's like you're, you're turned back into a baby. You have no way oh. to communicate anymore. That's what global That's... aphasia does to you. But then you can have receptive aphasia where someone can say something to you and you say some stuff back to them, but it's like garbly goop. They right. don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what they're talking about. And so that's a horrible, you know, way to be left. But then someone like your aunt, which is a more common type of aphasia, is a is a um, a um, receptive type of aphasia. Not receptive. It is a motor aphasia. That's it. Motor mm -hmm, aphasia. Mm -hmm. um, so a motor aphasia is more of a aphasia where you can't form the words. Like the mm -hmm. motor part of your muscles aren't working right, but you can receive it. So you're recepting. You're receiving it. You just can't motor function and, and push those words out. Right. So, and there's different forms of that. Some people are motor aphasic and they can't speak at all. Mm -hmm. Some people are motor aphasic and they can say words. Yes, no. Right. And, yeah. And you know, they're like in there. Yeah. Yes. You, you know, they're in there, but they just can't get the, they're not eloquent in the, in the way that they used to be able to speak. Um, some people are left not able to read. Some people are left not able to write. 
Some people are left not able to like certain functions that they learned, like riding a bike, those things that you learn and are stored in parts of your brain, that parts got knocked out. Now you can't ride a bike anymore. Now you can't perform surgery anymore. Now mm. you can't, all those functions that you learn later in life might go away because of that portion of your brain lost oxygen and died. Mm. So there's so many things that can happen post-stroke that people don't even think about. Correct. Correct. And I mean, honestly, just listening to you talk about this, especially seeing that, you know, you're a neurologist, it really like right now, after we're done, I'm about to go take my blood pressure, you know, just to make sure, see right. what it is. Um, because honestly, I really see prevention. Prevention is seems like to really be the key yes. in minimizing your risk of developing strokes. So one last question that I have for you, and I know, you know, you've alluded to it throughout our conversation. Let's talk about nutrition, my mm -hmm. powerhouse. So what role does diet play in preventing or delaying um, strokes? And also after someone has a stroke, what role have you seen it in your personal uh, yes. career play in, in recovery? Okay. So I'm passionate about the recovery side because that's when I usually get in on it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually even more passionate though about the beforehand. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's a couple of two things that I, I would say that people need to really watch. There's sodium intake. Mm. And, and when you know, when you really understand how little salt we're supposed to have, it's mind boggling, yeah. you know, two grams. Yes, that's it. Much. That's not, not that's much. two teaspoons. Mm -hmm. And that's your toe. And that's, that's when people say, oh, I'm on a low sodium diet, two gram diet. No, you, everybody's supposed to be on a low sodium diet. We're all supposed to be there. Um, so right. that's why people run around with blood pressure issues because they're just not, this is salt. So salt is number one. That's one of the first things I would say. Number mm -hmm. two is eat food that you could make at home. Like stop eating all of these foods that are manufactured, um, whole foods, vegetables, fruit, lean protein, just everything yeah. that we know we're supposed to do. And then hydrate, right. stop being yeah. dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's another thing that can increase your risk of a wake up stroke is being dehydrated. Wow. So wow. hydrate. And and if you not, don't have an issue with peeing in the middle of the night, drink a little water before you go to bed. Um, right. So <laughs> this way you're not dehydrated because that's, I mean, that's another reason, like a, a lesser form of a stroke and the higher strokes that people have when they are on blood pressure, um, not blood pressure on uh, birth control are these strokes that are venous or vein, the vein system strokes out and mm -hmm. an increased risk of that is dehydration so wow. hydrate um so those things sodium hydration and then eating a, a good diet that we all know we're supposed to be eating fruits and vegetables lean protein and cut out all of this manufactured you know artificial artificial sweeteners all that stuff those artificial sweeteners are just of the devil um because your body your brain is like uh, what is that's, that's kind of sweet. Should I put out some insulin? I don't right, know. right. Maybe Confused I should put some system. insulin out and they put out a little insulin. Then your body says, oh, there's insulin. Oh, I can eat some sugar. So right. then you start eating sugar, but you have, it's just, it's just a vicious cycle that your brain plays a role in because, um, our bodies are thinking we've been evolved over thousands of years. When your brain senses something sweet, what does it do? It secretes insulin. So and then, but mm. you're not eating something that has actual sugar in it, but you've had this extra insulin being produced. So now your body's thinking, well, I need to have some real sugar. Mm. And then you eat some bread or eat some crackers or eat something that's going to turn into real 